What's up, future respiratory therapists? Hey, in this video, I'm going to show you how to tell the difference between our arterial blood gas versus the venous blood gas. When you stick that patient and you get those results and they're crazy and you're thinking, is this arterial or venous? That's what this video is about. Let's dive in. Alrighty, so I told you as we get started here, this video is all about just differentiating with the values that you have in your hand, how can you tell the difference between an arterial blood gas versus a venous blood gas? And when we look at it from this perspective here, you see there's a lot of numbers up here, but I gotta give you the data, right? The left side of your screen is all arterial values and they're all normal. You see, we have a normal pH at 7.40. We have a normal CO2 at 40 millimeters of mercury. We have a normal PaO2 at 80 millimeters of mercury. We have a normal bicarb at 24 milliequivalents per liter. And we have a normal SaO2 at 96%. Now, when you look at the right side of your screen, we see normal values for a venous blood gas, pH 7.35, PV, CO2. The V tells you you're looking at venous blood. The A tells you it's arterial. PV, CO2, 45. PVO2 40, bicarb 24 milliequivalents per liter, and SVO2 70%. Now, take a second and look at these values and tell me where you see the big differences. Where are the big differences? I'm not talking about the small, like, oh, they're kind of close, but they're not the same. I'm talking about the big differences. Pause the video right now and do that. Come back. I'm going to keep talking. So when we look at these, what we see here is, is that we have two numbers here that stand out that are substantially different than the other values. And here's what I want you to realize. When we look at those, we see this number right here, 80 and 40. Don't you see that big difference right there? And then we see the difference here between our saturation arterial versus venous. Now this is important because what we know is that arterial blood goes out to the tissues with oxygen in it. And then the, the tissues, they eat up that, they consume that oxygen. And so it makes sense why the venous blood comes back with less oxygen than the arterial blood. The same reason that our saturation on the venous side is less than on the arterial side. And, and that's because there's less oxygen in venous blood. Now, the same process can be applied, but I want to point out and talk about the other values here as well. You see, look at our pH. They are different, but venous blood is always slightly more acidotic than arterial blood. Why is that? Well, we just told you the answer. The tissues consume the oxygen. What's the byproduct of oxygen consumption? CO2. So you, you see now where the, the, the tissues consume the arterial oxygen and create more CO2. That's why your PVCO2 is slightly higher than your arterial CO2. Makes sense, right? Your bicarb should be relatively equal amongst these, okay? So, so bicarb doesn't help you in this process. Your CO2 and your pH should make sense when you understand them, but there's no tools you can use to know and utilize CO2 and pH to go, oh, this is venous. You see, what can we use to tell us this is arterial or this is venous? And the answer to that question is, your oxygenation values. Now, the kicker to this is, is that anytime, anytime you stick a patient to obtain an arterial blood gas, you should also observe what their SpO2 is. What is their pulse oximetry telling you their saturation is? That number is going to be very, very important because that number should be close to your SaO2 number. And so what I'm telling you here is, is that if you just look at that number, if you have a, a, a patient with an SpO2 of 96% and you run the blood gas and you come back with an SvO2 of 70%,
That's probably not an arterial blood gas. That's probably a venous blood gas. Now, your number, the machine doesn't know if it's arterial or venous. So whatever you run, you're going to, if you tell the machine to run an arterial blood gas, you're going to get these values that say PaCO2, PaO2, SaO2. Because the, the machine is just telling you, hey, you told me to run an arterial blood gas. And, and, and you, you're, you're saying you're putting arterial blood in here. So the results I'm going to give you are going to be reported as arterial values. You see, that's where you come in as the respiratory therapist who is able to critically think about these values and go, you know what? This isn't an arterial blood gas. This is 100% of venous blood gas. Okay. So you have to be able to do that. Now, let's look at a practice question here and let me show you what I'm talking about. This is a, a practice question here where it says you are called to obtain and assess an arterial blood gas on a patient in respiratory distress. The patient is tachypneic and tachycardic. Now, right there, what does that tell you? It means they are breathing fast, higher than normal, greater than 20 breaths per minute, and their heart rate is elevated, greater than 100 beats per minute tachypneic and tachycardic with an SpO2 of 88%. Now, that 88% is very, very important because when you stick that patient and you get that blood and you go back to that blood gas lab and run it, you know the saturations were 88%. Now, that's very, very important. And I'll tell you why here in just a second. ABG analysis reveals the following results. Here's what you get. PH is 731, CO2 of 49. Remember, we already talked from the information we're given. We can't do anything with that information. It doesn't help us determine the validity of the results we just got. So this doesn't help us. Bicarb doesn't help us. What does help us here? Our PaO2, 32 millimeters of mercury. Oh, that's weird. 32 millimeters of mercury. Whoa, this patient is severely hypoxemic, right? When you look at that. But when you look at your stats, you go, wait, 55%. Now, do you think a patient will have a saturation of 55% and a pulse ox at 88%? Probably not. And so let me show you what we're talking about here because that's how you know that this was a venous blood gas. And you may be asking yourself, well, well how would I get venous blood when I was sticking an artery? Well, Next to every radial artery are two veins that run parallel to it. So it's very easy to get venous blood in the attempt to get arterial blood. Various signs can lead you down this pathway, right? The brightness of the blood. Arterial blood is typically very, very bright. Venous blood is going to be darker. The uh, our artery is a high pressure vessel. So when you stick that artery, the, the, the syringe should fill relatively quickly where with venous blood that's a low pressure system it may take much longer for that to fill but there's still those times 23 years in the field and i still have those times where i question is this arterial is it is what uh, maybe it is maybe it isn't let's see what the results say but the results always come back to this right here we were satting 88 percent and in my mind I know that that is an approximately a PaO2 of 58 millimeters of mercury. Now you may say to yourself, well, how do you know that? Well, I'll tell you in a second. But when I'm thinking 58 millimeters of mercury and I get results of 32 millimeters of mercury, I know immediately that this is venous blood. It's not arterial. It's just not because there shouldn't be that big of a discrepancy between my pulse ox and my SAO2 on my blood gas report. And I also know how to appropriately estimate what my PaO2 is going to be. Let me show you how right now. Now, what we're looking at here is the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay. And so when we look at that, what we see is, is that we know that there is this curve that happens. And we know that this is associated with the uh, hemoglobin's affinity to oxygen. So it helps us guide ourselves. And when we look at a pulse oximetry, we can more um, correctly estimate what our PaO2 actually is. Now, Egan's talks about this in chapter 12. 
This is the gas exchange and transport section. So I'm reading out of that right now. This is Egan's, the uh, 12th edition. And this is on page 265. And it tells us this. It says, a patient with a pulse oximetry reading of 90% has a PaO2 of approximately 60 millimeters of mercury. If the saturation decreases to 80%, the PaO2 would decrease to approximately 50 millimeters of mercury. This rule works only in the middle range of PO2 values where the curve is most linear. It should not be applied with hemoglobin saturations greater than 90% or less than 70%. So you see what we're talking about here. Anytime your saturation is between the 60 to 70 mark and up to the 90% mark, we can kind of estimate what our PaO2 is. We call this the 30, 60, 90 rule. And what that means is, is that if you have a saturation of 90%, you can subtract 30 from it. And that is approximately your PaO2. 90%, approximately 60 millimeters of mercury. 80%, minus 30, approximately 50 millimeters of mercury. 70%, minus 30, approximately 40, 60% minus 30, approximately 30. And it stops there. That's the, it's the only time you can use this. Now, go back to the scenario we had over here. We had a patient with a saturation of 88%. So what did I do? In my mind, I subtract 30 and I go, my PaO2 should be roughly 58 millimeters of mercury. Roughly. This is an estimate. It's not going to be exact, but it's going to be an estimate. So when I see 32 millimeters of mercury, hmm, that's weird. This can't be arterial because that's just not how the body works, okay? So there is this thing called the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, which can help you. It can help you identify when you get arterial blood versus venous blood. Now it says up to 90%. So anything, anytime you have your patient who is satting 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. You can't use this because you see how it flattens out for infinity? It's saturation, PaO2 may be 100, 110, 120, 300. You can't use this when your saturation is greater than 90% because now it starts to curve up and flatten out. Same on the bottom. It starts to curve and flatten down. But we don't talk about this area very much because these patients likely aren't alive. But anything in this range on the steep portion of the curve can be estimated. And that's how you use your pulse ox in conjunction with your arterial blood gas analysis to help you differentiate between an arterial blood gas versus a venous blood gas. I'm respiratory coach. That's ABG versus VBG. Hey, you're here with me right now on YouTube. Stay here, hit the like button, leave me a comment. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I really appreciate us building this community of, of, of conversation to where we can all get better together. Uh, at respiratory coach on Instagram, at respiratory coach on TikTok. Come find me on LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. And then finally, send me an email, respiratory coach at gmail.com. I'd love to converse with you. I'd love to hear your story. I'd love to help you pass your board exams. I would love anything that you feel you want to talk to me about. That's what that email is there for. Send me a message. I promise I'll respond to you in a fair amount of time. Remember, this, 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 this field we're in, this profession that you were studying, respiratory therapy, it's vitally important. Nothing is impossible unless you're not breathing and you're learning how to help people do just that. So remember, average is easy. Don't be it.